This is Maureen Elward. You're listening to Backcast Cape Ann. The stories you hear as part of Backcast Cape Ann series on the LBGTQ community highlights their contribution, care, and activism. It's a look back at experiences, significant moments, and persistent memories. I'm here with Fred Cowan, who describes himself as a full-time community volunteer, Mm -hmm. has been in Gloucester for 35 years. Uh, 40. 40, 40 years, but uh, is very active in the community, board of trustees for the Sawyer Free Library, board of directors for Needy Meds. He participates in Gloucester's Board of Health, the Council on Aging, and is very active with the Open Door Fred, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a really lovely thing to have you here. My pleasure. We've got a lot of ground to cover. You yeah. certainly do have a fascinating story. So you're an openly gay man. Yes. And I would like for you to describe your relationship with your parents. Uh, I'm the middle of three sons, but I'm very different from my brothers. My career as a son uh, was uh, tainted with a lot of failure. As a student, I had a terrible career. Um, I began to fail academically in elementary school. My parents were terrific at trying to come up to a solution for that. I was tested and was moved from one school to another and whatnot, and just continued to fail, 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 fail consistently. Instead of being disappointed, my parents were, were supportive, as helpful as they could be. I was the, the odd son. Um, I didn't go away to school. Um, primarily because other schools wouldn't have me. Um, So I went to day schools in Worcester, up in uh, middle school and and, uh, high school, and lived at home. Uh, My older brother went um, to Andover and then to Harvard and Harvard Medical School, and my younger brother went to Taft and then to Trinity College and then to uh, Theological uh, Seminary. Uh, My younger brother's an Episcopal priest, and my older brother is a radiologist, a doc. And then there's me, (laughs) who flunked out from Ohio Wesleyan in 1968 with a thud. With the support of my parents, my parents um, said when they got notice that Ohio Wesleyan had asked me to leave, um, by the time I made it home, an appeal before the draft board had already been placed. Um, My dad started that ball rolling so that um, I could achieve an earned medical deferment. It's no treat having a lower back problem that I was born with. But it did save my life and keep me from going to um, Vietnam. They said that they were behind me, but that I was going to be on my own, that I would receive no money from them unless it's for medical or education. Those two things they would pay for. But my cost of living was on me. Um, They thought that was important. And as it turned out, it was hugely important. So at 19, you were on your own. Totally. You were out, needed to find a job. Yep. My dad helped set up an interview at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Boston. Um, And they uh, found me a rare duck in that 1968, there weren't many um, uh, men who could could work. They were all being drafted. So with my one wide draft, they put me on the desk at the Ritz-Carlton. And for the first time in my adult life, I began to succeed. I'm really good at doing things one at a time. And hotel industry is just perfect for that. It's you at the desk. putting yourselves basically in my hands, please provide me with food and shelter for the night. And I was really good at it. So good that um, management at the hotel wanted me to become a leader in the industry, um, only to find when I attempted to go to Cornell Hotel School that um, I I didn't make it past the interview because I failed the test, of course. (laughs) But you knew that that was going to (laughs) happen. Yes, but they wouldn't (laughs) listen to me. So So I proved myself right (laughs) and could go back to the environment where I was guaranteed to succeed. They took me off the desk and sent me upstairs into the business end of the hotel, which proved to be woefully um, in need of some help. And um, long story short, I ended up by being the youngest hotel credit manager in the city of Boston by age 24. That's remarkable. Yeah. I kept 6,000 accounts in my head, basically. I was very good at the job, and I loved it, too. The people were wonderful. So I knew them as hotel guests and then also from the business side. Mm -hmm. And I ran an office of 13 people, too. I had no experience succeeding, so I really wasn't aware of how good I was at that, um, except that everyone around me thought I was good. (laughs) 
My parents um, asked me to, to come to Worcester for lunch when I was uh, just short of my 21st birthday. And um, it was over lunch that my father told me that I was a homosexual. To quote him, he said, kind of, your mother and I think you should know that um, you are um, a homosexual. And although we didn't know it at the time, your godmother is a lesbian and is living with Mila in Mexico City, and that's sort of what that's about. And your younger brother is named after a guy named Len Wielden, who was a, a writer for the Herald, who they were very fond of, who was also a gay man. And then they began to identify people around the city that they knew to be gay and lesbian as a way of assurance, really. What was that like for you to have well, I dropped lunch my with fork. Your... <laughs> <laughs> I dropped my fork. This is a very <laughs> unusual story yes. because, mo I mean, this is remarkable <laughs> that your parents yeah. were so kind and, and helping you, supportive mm -hmm. and kind. And mm -hmm. here they are taking you to lunch to inform you that you're a homosexual. That's right. Up to that point, I really had not made the connection between who I was and what I would be called what not, my presumption of, of homosexuals were people who lurked in the darkness and were up to no good, um, who would, well, just all of the stereotypical stuff, and that was not me. I had been called faggot by high school classmates because I gave off signals that I tried hard to hide, look in the mirror after I'd get dressed and take things off that I thought were, were giving the wrong impression and signal. So I had spent a good 20 years of my life basically acting, hiding, lying to myself. My parents were um, not about lying. My parents were, were, were truth tellers to me. And I remember going home after lunch that day thinking kind of, you know, I am? You know, really? You know, knowing that they were behind me and that my, my brothers, I could expect, would be as well. So that the stereotypical story of being ostracized or thrown out or disowned or or, or shamed is not part of my history at all. What was being gay in Boston in the 70s like? For me, it was um, exciting and promising and fulfilling. One of the kindest things that was done for me was a fellow who I met by accident who took me to dinner. Um, and over dinner, in our conversation, he made a decision that was life-changing for me. He took me to a place on Cambridge Street in Boston called Sporters, which was one of, I think, three established large gay bars in the city. And I remember walking across the threshold into a room of people who turned and smiled and basically mouthed, where have you been all my life? Um, and everything about me that I had tried so hard to hide was suddenly desirable and desirous and appreciated. And um, it just, uh, I, I can't begin to tell you truthfully um, how accepted I felt. Um, and over time, I met people there from all walks of life, truly, um, up until Stonewall, uh, which happened maybe six months or so before all of this. It was a very risky thing to be out and about. People had careers and private lives, and then they were gay on the side. So the commingling of people of, of different education and, and uh, cultures and, and professions and whatnot was um, expected. And I could sit sipping on my diluted bourbon and water and discover that somebody was a college professor or he drove a cab or was a porter in a hotel or uh, was a married guy with six kids or was a teacher at Tufts, or on and on and on and on and on. Yeah. I was a very sexual person at that point. I'd spent so much of my life saying no to myself. Uh, I just couldn't justify saying no for no's sake or for holding myself accountable to the moral restrictions that religion might have imposed because religion at its very core condemned myself and my existence. So why ever would I hold myself accountable to their rules? And I was surrounded by people of like mind, um, so that if someone said the term was to trick back then, and that meant, to, would you like a sexual liaison that um, where uh, you, you um, don't have to do anything you don't want to do in a safe environment? And the automatic answer for me was yes. I didn't learn to be afraid of people. The presumption that anybody would harm me never crossed my mind. Um, and they were thrilled to be with me because back then I was indeed very beautiful, uh, delighted to say yes. Yes, this was post Stonewall. Right. Come out, come out wherever you are. And, yeah. and people who had been hiding, whether they admitted it or not, 
uh, were actually stepping beyond their thresholds out into the sunshine and, and discovering that it wasn't the end of their careers. Um, that a lot of people yawned when they were told that, you know, you know, Aunt Mildred, I need to tell you I'm gay. Yes, dear, we've known this since you were 12. <laughs> well, Mildred, why didn't you tell me? Well, you never asked, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> that was very pervasive. I had been uh, so isolated in my privilege, I never connected that uh, being ignorant had um, a cost to it until I had been spending time by myself where I got bored with my own daydreams. They turned it up by being circular. So I learned to go to dinner with people and be quiet and listen. Um, when people would ask me questions, half the time it was including the answer. You know, don't you think it's amusing that X, Y, and Z is true? Would be how I would be included in conversations. And people began to send me boxes of books, knowing that in the setting of my uh, home in Ipswich, that I would read them. Um, mm -hmm. And so I learned a lot in depth about things that were of interest to my friends. So know. it sounds like the dinner parties and the dinner table was your college lecture hall. Yes, that's a, that's a very fair analogy, yes. In a setting where I could learn. In a setting that, where you could learn, where you could listen, yes. where you were unafraid to fail because right. you already were successful. That's right, that's yeah. absolutely, yes. And that, and that admitting that I didn't know um, was part of the fun because then they got to teach me. There's a great deal of my life that has been just remarkable good fortune. I seemed to innately turn left at an opportune time, and I'm way down that road to the left before I realize I've made the good decision. And this has happened a lot in my life. Um, Why do you think that is? Do you think you just trust yourself? So much had been wrong about me that um, I really was in a position to decide what was right. And so when, yes, when I have an intuitive sense that turning left is the right thing for me to do, I do turn left. When I started to succeed, I had this gnawing thing in the back of my head that success was, had been denied to me up to that point, so this must all be illusion, and that it's all gonna blow up. And I hear that people who are successful in theater or, or in show business always have this feeling that they're gonna lose, that their success is, is um, an illusion, or, or at least fleeting, gonna be fleeting. Much of my career um, as, a, as a community volunteer involved being a support network for someone else, um, focusing on a particular task that a person was up to. I'm the person who hands the speaker the fact sheet. You know, I wrote the fact sheet and I hand it up and, it, and it's he or she who delivers the information. And I did that for a long time on behalf of someone else. And when I find now in my later life that people want me to ascend in, in organized leadership to become the president of this or the chairman of that, I find in some instances that although I can do it, I shouldn't. It's exhausting for me. It wakes me at four in the morning, worrying that I've overlooked something, trying to remember five, six things from a conference for me is, is a terribly difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'm really much better being supportive of the person who does that naturally. Right, uh, and you know your role, yeah. and you're happy. In yeah. It. See, I haven't been paid for a job in 40 years um, so that my compensation for what I do is, in, is not in money. It's in access or information or cooperation or stimulation or something like that, but not money. Mm -hmm. So being supportive of somebody, um, they're not afraid of me because I don't want their job. Um, I only want them to do better. Tell me about yeah. your wonderful love story with your husband. Oh, yeah. Will you please bring us back to the, <laughs> to the beginning? Because it, it was, is truly a beautiful love story. Well, it was springtime, 1973. I was uh, leaving Ritz-Carlton, heading home to Ipswich in my ancient Saab station wagon, and the clutch began to give me a hard time. It, it was on its way out, and I was in traffic, so I thought I'd get off of Star Drive and uh, pull up and go into Sporters for a beer and let the traffic clear. And when I arrived there, um, it was only about five people in this place that would have normally had 500. 
and I was um, sitting at the bar and looked across at this and, and saw this very good looking guy who was not although at all my type, type being kind of tall, dark, black haired Irishman. Um, and this was a guy who was smaller and rather red and whatnot and still just amazing um, magnetism. And uh, I went over and uh, he was having a, eating a sandwich and drinking a Coke and we got into a conversation and I really thought this was a pretty special person. He was moonlighting over at um, Mass General across the street. So I reached into my wallet and pulled out one of the earliest lottery tickets that had on the back of it a place where you could put in your name and address. Uh, it was not a winning ticket, so I filled it out with my name and address. And I but gave you it were to hoping him. it was going well, to be a winning I, ticket. I gave it to him because <laughs> those days I didn't have a, a, you know, a, a personal card in my pocket and no <laughs> way to write my name and address. I gave it to him, and the traffic cleared, and I went home, and, and, no, and no word from this guy. It's late September. I'm back at Sporters one evening, surrounded by my friends sitting at the bar. And I look up across the room, and there's this guy who walks around the crowd and comes up, and I'm back to talking with my friends. And suddenly, I look up, and there he is, and he hands me this lottery ticket with my name and address on it. And I just remember looking up, saying, doctor? And he nodded his head. Well, he was on call that night, and I had to go back to Ipswich. So we call November 1st our anniversary because that was the day that he could come to Ipswich and stay for a while. So, and we've just had our 45th anniversary. There's 11 years th difference between us and it was a very good time for both of us. He was, had finally gotten established in his profession, which was very cutting edge. It was gastroenterology at the very earliest days. In a matter of two weeks, really, I knew that this was um, different from other men who had cherished me and I had, I had loved them back. Um, uh, I had reason still to, to think that deeply and profoundly for other men who had been a part of my life and had uh, loved me physically and emotionally and had believed in me and whatnot. And thus Dick was different. Um, mm -hmm. There was a depth of human emotion there that was undeniable and trustworthy. When he um, uh, told me he loved me, and I believed him with um, a depth of trust that uh, enabled me to shift my focus and my priorities, to imagine a life of ascendancy and growth for both of us. So you lived yep. in Boston in the 70s and you uh, started to see a shift in your friends, and, and Dick was seeing folks on the sides. Well, there was a, a, um, a small room up at, on, the, on the rooftop of this building that contained bathroom and a shower and, a, and where the elevator let out um, and a small sitting area, which Dick turned into a private office because he saw people who had SDDs who did not want to reveal that to their employers or insurance carriers. So on a regular basis, um, probably 20, 30 or so people came to us. They'd um, be checked up, receive a treatment and whatnot, and then come downstairs and have dinner with us. And that would be kind of where I would get involved in, in that. So I got very fond of these people and then met a lot of them. Uh, they began to die um, with uh, alarming uh, frequency and in bulk. Two or three at a time would uh, disappear. What were those conversations between you and Dick like as, as some of his uh, well, private patients were starting to die? Were well, you worried? Yes. We, we had a deal that we didn't talk about HIV at home because then there would be no place to escape it. In the early days, we were not so clear about that. And I remember him being concerned because without having a nurse present, he had stuck himself many times with needles after he had drawn blood or, or given injections for his patients, and he began to be concerned that um, he may have infected himself with whatever it was. So for a long time, he never tested um, because he didn't want to know. Our first friend died in 1975, um, uh, a strapping, strong fellow, half of a, of, a, of, a, of a revered partnership with another guy, a proof positive to me early on that people could be um, uh, out and in partnership and own a place together and be part of a community and a neighborhood. 
And this guy, um, one night, began to feel pretty awful and took himself to the Mass General where they gave him some pills and sent him home. And that night in the bathroom, he drowned in his own fluids from what we now, I presume, was probably pneumocystis carini pneumonia. But in 75, it just stunned the community. But Dick, being a doc, people looked to him for explanations and guidance. And that was the first drumbeat, really, of... The war ahead. Yeah. So let's move ahead a little bit mm -hmm. to your work with the AIDS Action Committee. And you were there for such a long time, yes. an early advocate and activist. For us and HIV, we had no anticipation that, that this was going to happen until we were faced with it. And what happened was that people, they stopped what they were doing to respond to this as yet unnamed catastrophe. All they knew is that their friends were dying and they couldn't explain why, and that um, people were healthy and then could die within a matter of weeks. And our government wasn't responding, and, and that was familiar. Gay people didn't expect our government to come and help us because of what um, was happening to us. And so we went into a siege mentality. AIDS Action Committee at that point had been founded by half a dozen volunteers. Larry Kessler had been a run a bookstore in Vermont and just couldn't stand it and, and closed the shop and came back to Boston. He'd been trained as a Jesuit and therefore he was great at marshalling support and, and, and telling people what to do. Um, they rented some space on Boylston Street over the Ritz camera store and when they needed space, they just busted walls down and kept growing horizontally. I was doing some development work for a school in the western part of the state a great irony that I should be involved in <laughs> helping a school. <laughs> but <laughs> this was a school that I thought <laughs> might have helped me, <laughs> founded by a couple of friends, when it just, I couldn't stand it anymore. Um, we were writing checks at $100 a piece for our friends to AIDS Action Committee. I thought $100 was a way to get their names written down as not having died from pneumonia or from unexplained causes or however it was said in the newspaper. So you wrote a check in honor of your friend yes. to the AIDS Action Committee so it would be a yes. mo in memoriam? Yes. And that way they were... Remembered. Remembered, and also it was clear what they died of. Yes. When AIDS first uh, emerged before Bill Weld was governor, if you were tenant, you could be um, evicted. You could come home and find your possessions on the lawn if you were gay, you could be fired. Certainly if you were a teacher, you could be fired simply for being gay. Mm -hmm. So it was very dangerous to be revealed as HIV positive for fear of therefore the connection being made that you were gay to come home and find your furniture on the lawn. So being um, private about that was, had nothing to do with shame. It was simply a matter of survival. And I understood that. The problem was that the people who would have advocated loudly and aggressively against adopting the notion of a stigma died. Mm -hmm. And there was no one alive to combat those who um, uh, branded um, being HIV positive uh, with this stigma. Tell me about your work at the Age Action Committee. Well, they said we need help in accounting. And I said, terrific. So I took over their credit rating. And I saw to it that their bills were paid promptly so that I could go out First of all, reassure people that if you did business with the AIDS Action Committee, that, that you'd get paid, that, that contracts um, that got signed meant something, and that um, uh, I could turn your, your bill around in 10 days um, and so therefore give me a discount. So um, then I ended up by being the person who uh, logged the checks that were given in me memory of people who had died. So I saw entrances in that book. <sighs> Of checks back. that Dick and I had sent for a hundred dollars, it was painful. Um, I remember my first day there. I put together the bank deposit, and I went to what was then the New England Merchants National Bank, with the money bag in my hand, and standing in line because uh, those days you dealt with a teller. And um, when I was waiting there, I opened the bag and began to leaf through the checks. And I discovered a check for a man who I had loved for many years who had died, who I didn't know had died. And it was a, um, from his hometown, someone who had, was doing what I had done for my friends, which was to memorialize him. 
So standing in line at the bank, I started to cry. And when it came time for me to go up to the teller, I handed the bag of checks over and she began to cry. So the supervisor, sitting across the bank in her glass cubicle, looked up and saw me with my head down and she in tears. And so she came across to say, kind of see here what's going <laughs> on here. And she began to cry. So that was my first day at AIDS Action. It gave me a purpose and a, and a feeling of being useful that nothing could touch for the next almost 30 years. The Health Project now helps many people. It was founded as the North Shore AIDS Health Project, and Dick and I are one of the founders. In order to keep AIDS Action and the Health Project from duplicating services, my job was to be the liaison, the unofficial liaison between the two organizations. Today, being HIV positive is rarely a topic of discussion. We now know that the triple therapies works at least 20 some odd years because I have a friend in Provincetown who's still alive. I look forward to the future now. Um, I, what I'm doing now is intended to improve the future. I spent 30 years of my life doing my damnedest to prevent the future from happening. I used to be involved in helping people obtain something called viatical settlements, which is to convince your life insurance company that you're not going to live for very long and therefore help you borrow money against your policy. Um, and I, so it was my job to convince the insurance company that a person was desperately sick without convincing the person who was desperately sick that he was about to die. AIDS Action Committee has, has uh, withdrawn in its size and its force. It's now gone back to being what it was originally, which was a subcommittee of, they don't call it Fenway Community Health any, any longer, but that was its origin. And those persons who are now clients usually are close, uh, have in, a measure of indigence. How do you celebrate life now, Fred? Every day. But I'm very much a one-day-at-a-time person. I plan, but I live day-to-day. Dick will say over dinner, you know, what are you doing tomorrow? And I say, I don't, I have no idea, you know. You know, I know I have something, I'm meeting with Maureen. And <laughs> <laughs> but anything before that, I'll have to look at my book. And I keep a paper book. Um, yeah, it's because I want to remember. And also when I change my mind, I line things through uh, that, that, um, that my life is, is not so regimented that I cannot change my mind. Um, uh, yeah. Well, Fred Cowan, thank you so much for being here on My the podcast. Pleasure. And it was just wonderful to talk with you. And I celebrate you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Fred. My pleasure. Backcast Cape Ann is a production of 1623 Studios. This show was produced by me, Maureen Elward, with technical assistance from Becky Tober. Find Backcast Cape Ann on 1623 Studios, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find all our podcast episodes on 1623studios.org.